<laughs> Welcome to the Daily Wire backstage. Joining us tonight, Andrew Clavin, accused hospital bomber <laughs> Matt Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> keep a straight face. Michael Knowles, and I'm very sorry. I know it will cause you great harm and pain that will always be with us. <laughs> ben Shapiro. I'm Daily Wire God King, lowercase g, lowercase k, Jeremy Boring. Uh, listen, we're doing things completely different around here. And we've started adding a member's block to every show. This show is no exception. So you'll be with us for the next 90 minutes. And after that, we hope you'll head over to dailywire.com and become a member. You'll get 35% off with code plus because we are, after all, Daily Wire Plus. And we'll be bringing you the member's block of Backstage, which is just more of us doing the same thing that we're doing here, only you pay for it. And a thousand times better. So (laughs) much advice. (laughs) Like we took all the best stuff for that part. (laughs) It actually is really important, and and as we've made this transition to Daily Wire Plus, we're trying to bring more and more value to our paying subscribers there who make it possible for us to do all of this. And so the members block is just another way of us giving them a little bit of extra access, and we'd love for you to become a member if you are not one already. So I don't know which one of the two threats to civilization that <laughs> hey Jeremy uh, in fairness today. in fa- so it's true we've got you know the hospital bomber and the yeah, yeah. podcast convention beer adder <laughs> but but in fairness according to Joe Biden all of us are terrorists yes, yeah. because statistically the entire Republican party poses an extreme existential threat to the homeland. Well, you make a fine point. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, <laughs> undoubtedly, he'll be sending F-15s to remedy, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to remedy, the, remedy the situation at any moment. I want to start by talking, Matt, about your situation. Uh, apparently, about my plot. About my your plot. plot. <laughs> yeah. How, how did you think you would get away with it? <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, it, does, it seems too on the nose, I guess. For, I, you know, the, the whole thing is just, uh, it's obviously completely absurd. So, I mean, the, the, the story is that after a couple of weeks of, not just me, by the way, lots of us talking about the fact that Boston Children's Hospital uh, performs gender surgeries on minors, which, which, they, which they do, that is a fact, um, uh, after, after talking about this, because what, what, we, what we've been told is that if you even acknowledge this reality, then you are inciting violence, even if you don't say that there is violence. That's right. And then what do you know, last night, there was uh, supposedly a bomb threat, and immediately the left realize that uh, it's, it's me and also Libs of TikTok is the other. So we, we, we got together and uh, we put this bomb threat together, I suppose. Do you Church have her Alliance number because of her right. being doxxed recently? Exactly. exactly. Libs of TikTok is an Orthodox Jew, by the way. So the Catholic <laughs> Jewish Alliance rides together. There, there you go. <laughs> I mean, always, always. The thing is, even, of course, like, even if there was a bomb threat, <clears throat> there's, there's no connection you can draw to the fact that we are simply talking about something that the hospital does and then somebody called in a bomb threat. There is, there is no connection there. And no. I also don't feel... You know, when I when I first heard about this last night, I didn't go on Twitter and say I unequivocally condemn bombing hospitals. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, like, everyone everyone knows that. I don't need to tell you that. That's the game the left wants. Well, you to say play. everyone again, not to. I mean, unless there are brave right wing patriots in there trying to fight their government, and then it's just F fifteen well, the hell out of, <laughs> out of that children's hospital. That's true. But then, but then of course it comes. It, it, it turns out this morning that uh, it's like, was there even a bomb threat in the first so place? So you said, is there even a bomb threat? What? Why would you doubt? Well, because <laughs> the list, because, uh, because we're hearing it from the media to begin with. Uh, but but uh, you know the, the the police apparently showed up. The details come out later. The the, yep. fir- the first indication is that the media last night they're all over this. This morning I woke up. I thought there was going to be headlines all over the place about bomb threats at the children's hospital, and there's nothing. They're not talking about it anymore. So that makes you suspicious. And then you realize that the police showed up. They were gone. They cleared the scene in like 30 minutes. Mm. Um, and then the, the post-millennial gets a hold of the, of the police report. They put it out there. On the police report, it never even says there was a bomb threat, just that there was a call about one. And then they showed up and there was nothing on the scene and they left, which makes you wonder, was there even a threat? Or did someone at the hospital see that someone left a bag and just and call and freak this out? Or was it a hoax? I this mean, is an absolute true story that we had an employee quit one time and they filed a series of sexual harassment complaints against the company. When I say a series, I mean an exhaustive series of sexual <laughs> harassment complaints. And one of them was that one of our employees had been listening to porn on his computer in her presence. And I couldn't, have, my very first thought was that in the long storied history of man's fall and, uh, and sin, sin uh, no one has ever used the term listened to pornography. <laughs> That's just a complete non-starter. And this is kind of that way, like, what is a call about a bomb threat? Yeah. Like, that's that language, no one has ever used this language before. Somebody a, called the hospital, yeah. like, somebody just called the hospital, and they said, hey, guys, 
Have you heard? Have you heard of <laughs> this thing called the bomb threat? It's, there's also, it's, what is it's, it? The, there's a, they've rigged the game here. It's pretty insidious what they're doing. You know, whether the, the bomb threat, there was no bomb, but whether someone actually called and made the bomb threat. And even if they did, there's no way it was that someone on the left. It seems more likely to me it's someone on the left. The left gains more from a bomb threat than the right does. So who's more likely well, to call? Beyond that, the, the left has this stupid game, which is that if they can any way tangentially connect anyone yes to an act of violence who is prominent on the right, they will do it. And meanwhile, they will openly bail people out of prison in the middle of riots <laughs> yeah. and then declare that they are in favor of funding the police, which is what Joe Biden did this week. So like, they're never responsible for any of the violence the, that they help. And the, that, that, yeah, that's, that's the game, right? Because on this particular issue, what, what the left wants to say is that there are no gender surgeries happening to minors. That's unequivocally false. It is happening. Um, and then if you speak up and say, well, no, I have evidence that it is happening, then they say, well, you're a terrorist. You're inciting violence. It's, by the way, it's, it's so almost... You're not allowed to prevent, present evidence against them without... It's, it's even a little more insidious because what they will say, it's what Mike Anton calls the celebration parallax. They will say, hey, we're doing gender surgeries for minors. Isn't that great? And then we will say, wait, wait, you're doing gender surgeries for minors? And they'll say, how dare you suggest that? That's a <laughs> lie. That's evil. That's... And so they're allowed to celebrate what they're doing. The minute you repeat their words back to them with any criticism, you're a conspiracy theorist, kook, uh, hospital bomber. I noticed this, by the way, this week about uh, Lizzo. Lizzo is like, I'm a fat, sex positive woman. You're like, you are a fat, sex positive woman. Like, How dare you? <laughs> She's a beautiful, beautiful person. Thin, you bastard. Skinny. And, and she, just historically beautiful. How <laughs> By every classical standard. You know, I'll tell you, when, when I see all these kinds of headlines, it makes me want to crawl right back in my bed. And when I crawl back in my bed, where am I going? I'm going to Helix, baby. I want to invite everyone into my boudoir, okay? If you, when you want a bed, do you want to sleep in my bed? Maybe you do. Call me later. But I think you want to sleep in a bed. No one does. <laughs> I think you want to sleep in a bed for you. And what Helix will do is provide you a mattress that is specifically made for you. They've got 14 unique mattresses. They've got a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, even a mattress made just for kids. So how will you know which Helix mattress is best for your body? Why you take the sleep quiz. It takes under two minutes. You will find out exactly how you want to sleep. That is why your personalized mattress will come right to your door free of charge, and they will offer a 100-night risk-free trial. Try out your new Helix mattress. See how your body adjusts. Decide it is the greatest fit ever. If you don't like it, you get a full refund. They'll pick it up for you, but you are going to love it. It's going to be great. Helix is offering up to $350 off all mattress orders and not one, but two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash backstage. This is their best offer yet. It won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. So I want to talk about the second big yeah. Daily Wire controversy uh, of the last week, and that is Ben's dangerous... Essence. Essence. My essence. <laughs> his, his, his very appearance. My spirit. At Podcast Movement. I think we have video here of, of Ben's assault on Podcast Movement. <laughs> Just so terrifying. Get a picture? All right, one, two, three. God bless you. Hey, thank you. All right, Ben. Pleasure to meet you. Oh, heroin. You reached right for him. Look at that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for everything you do. Thank Amazing. you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm excited about it. That's great. Thank you so much. This is huge. Thank you. Unbelievable. That was heroin. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to say exactly what happened. I haven't really spoken about this yet, uh, but I actually do think it's an important story. Uh, and that's that uh, Podcast Movement is the premier gathering of podcasters. It's an industry conference that happens every year. I spoke at it last year. It was here in Nashville at the Gaylord. Uh, and this year, because The Daily Wire is selling more and more of our own shows as we, as we bring more and more of our sales infrastructure in-house, uh, we sponsored Podcast Movement. You can go to their website, look under sponsors. There's Daily Wire. And we purchased a booth on the floor uh, at the conference. Well, a very good friend of ours, someone who's, who's been very good to the company, uh, who in the podcast space was also having a retirement party uh, that evening, the evening of, of podcast movement. So Ben and I flew into Dallas to, to attend this guy's retirement party, slap him on the back, thank him for everything that he's done uh, for the Daily Wire over the years. While we're there, we stopped by the conference that we are sponsoring to visit the booth that we paid for and our employees who've been there all week working and, and doing the important work of, of uh, 
helping us with our ad sales. Um, and and you can see from the video what happened. You know, it's a it's kind of a lightly attended conference. This isn't like, there's not like twenty five thousand people or something, but. The people who were there, people came up. They wanted to get a picture with Ben. We were probably on the floor for all of five minutes. Five minutes, yeah, maybe ten. Maybe 10. We made a loop, <clears throat> walked around, went to the retirement party, came home. I wake up the next morning and I see these tweets. And I'm going to read the tweets in their entirety because I think that they're so remarkable. This was put out by the official podcast movement Twitter account. Hi, folks. We owe you an apology before the sessions kick off for the day. Yesterday afternoon... Ben Shapiro <laughs> briefly visited the PM22 Expo area near the Daily Wire booth. Though he was not registered or expected, we take full responsibility for the harm done by his presence. Mm -hmm. Good for them. Yeah, that, There's <laughs> no way around it. <laughs> That's right. At least they didn't, they didn't right. shuck off the responsibility. You know? <laughs> There's no way around it. We agreed to sell the Daily Wire a first-time booth based on the company's large presence in podcasting. The weight of that decision is now painfully clear. <laughs> Shapiro is a co-founder. A drop-in, however unlikely, should have been considered a possibility. Many in our community are appalled, not just by this incident, but by our choice to take money from the Daily Wire in the first place. As a Twitter user said, this was signed off on by a human. Yes, during event planning, <laughs> the dangerous nature of the company's messaging was overlooked. Mm. Many in our community are appalled, not just by this incident, but by our choice to take money from the Daily Wire in the first place. I'm repeating myself. The, the final two tweets. Those of you who called this unacceptable are right. <laughs> in nine wonderful years growing and celebrating this medium, podcast movement has made mistakes. The pain caused by this one will always stick with us. Forever. We <laughs> promise that sponsors will be more carefully considered moving forward. Just to clarify... The Daily Wire representatives were scheduled, no Daily Wire representatives were scheduled to appear on panels, and Shapiro remained in the common space and did not have a badge. If you have questions, we're here to talk. <laughs> Thank you for reading, and we hope you'll continue to join us from here on I, out. I have to tell you, when I, when I first saw this, I had my usual reaction to everything, which is I cracked up. I mean, I started laughing. And then... First of all, I started to feel resentful because I haven't received an apology. I've been here seven yeah, yeah. years. <laughs> but, but the other thing is it actually isn't as, as funny as it could be. You know, I mean, when, yeah, yeah. whenever anybody attacks George Soros, who is actually an evil plotter trying to destroy America, <laughs> everybody said, well, you're anti-Semitic. You know, because George yeah, Soros yeah. passed through a kind of fog of jewelry at some point. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and here, and here we have, you know, like a mist, like the like the incredible shrinking man. He went through this kind of radioactive thing. But, you know, an actual Jew is harming us simply by existing. And I have to say, I thought about that for a minute, and I thought, well, what's the answer to his existing? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, what's the solution? And I thought right. this actually isn't as Maybe funny. Maybe a final. It's not, mm -hmm. it's you, know? Not, you know, it's not, a, yeah, I want a final solution to that. I thought, like, this actually isn't as funny as I thought it was <laughs> for the first half hour. Yeah. You know? If Ben's mere presence does yes. harm, then the only way to prevent harm it's, it's is to ensure that Ben... Has no presence. Has no presence. Well, the, the, the joke's on them because, honestly, I didn't tell anyone, but I did leave some of my aura in the HVAC. <laughs> so well after I had left, I still lingered there. And I'll be there for years. Well, I, <laughs> I appreciate that you have a sense of humor about it, but it's not funny. It's, it is an actual rhetorical call to violence. Yeah. A rhetorical call to violence and, to say that— Walsh Walsh here, and he's a dangerous that's right. man. Right? If someone's presence is, causes harm, then the obvious conclusion <laughs> is that they must not have presence. The second thing is, we gave these people our money. So I immediately read these, and I go to DM the president of Podcast Movement to figure out what the hell, right? How to get your money back. He's preemptively blocked me on wow. Twitter. So I call some of our pals around the movement, you know, people who we've done business with, and ask them to, to apply some soft pressure. I say, listen, I, I'm going to I'm gonna have to go to war with Podcast Movement. I mean, this is an outright act of bigotry. Yep. That is the actual correct word. Mm -hmm. It is an outright expression of bigotry. Uh, but I don't want to do that. Please apply some soft pressure and try to get these guys to retract this statement and, and, and issue an apology and commit to having the dominant podcast conference in the country be inclusive of the sixth largest <laughs> podcast company in the world and one of the 10 largest podcasts uh, in the world. It seems like maybe we should be present at podcast movement. So people made a few phone calls. And then I hear later that evening, from one of the owners uh, of Podcast Movement. And I, I'm going to tell you what the guy said, and I'm going to say something about myself that I'm actually a little embarrassed about, which is 
I cried on this phone call. My, my voice started to break. I got so emotional. I've never gotten emotional over one of these things. But mm. We get canceled. We get called racist. We get called whatever, right? And, you know, I take it. It doesn't bother me. Obviously, Ben's got a great uh, perspective on it. But here's what happened. The guy calls me, and I'm, I'm just going to hear him out. I'm going to hear what he has to say, hoping, hoping maybe that this is the resolution we've been looking for. And he starts the call. He's got a great radio voice. All these guys have great radio voices. Yeah. Truly. And he says, Jeremy, uh, you know, so-and-so gave me your phone number. And I just wanted to let you know that we have a policy here in Podcast Movement that the talent not appear. And you'll notice, like, Joe Rogan has never appeared on our stage. We don't like for the talent to appear. And so Ben showing up caused some of my other sponsors to be angry because they want to know, why can't our talent be here if Ben can be here? And so I just want you to know this statement is a reaction to other sponsors being angry that their talent didn't get equal treatment. That's why I called for his extermination. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and he said... And a his, little leap. but yeah. He said this was not in any way political. Yeah. And when he said it, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm embarrassed about it. I got so adrenalized and yeah. so upset. Yeah. And I said, not in any way political. And I just started reading from the tweets. The danger of this company, the dangerous... Uh, uh, Endless pain. The, yeah. the pain that will be with us forever, the harm caused by his very presence. So that, you're saying that that isn't political? You're saying that that's because he showed up? By the way, <laughs> podcast hosts appear on all of their panels. Yeah. <laughs> it's just nonsense. The whole fracking conference is for podcasters, yeah. for people in podcasting. Uh, I said, you're going to tell me this isn't political? You called, uh, you, you canceled us from the play. You sent us an email that said we can't be here anymore. No, we did not ban you from the conference. Your people are there now. Right, because I told them to ignore your stupid email <laughs> and go to our booth anyway. I said, uh, I said, there's no one else in the world who would be subjected to this kind of bigotry and you get away with it. There, yeah, you could not treat a black man this way. You could not treat a lesbian woman this way. You could not treat anyone on the left in any way. Disney would have walked out of the conference, right? Like iHeart and Westwood One, Cumulus, all would have walked out of the conference. But you can treat a conservative this way with un, uh, unadulterated bigotry on the page. I, anyway, what I told the guy, well, I didn't say all that. What I said to the guy was, take down the tweet, apologize for the tweet, and commit to keeping this conference a neutral place for, for all podcasters. And he said, well, uh, now the problem with that is that just makes it political on the other side. And I said, yeah, I can't unstep on the can rake for you, pal. <laughs> <laughs> this is an actual, take it down and apologize. I said, well, I'll have to talk to my people about whether or not we can do that. So, of course, the day goes by, it doesn't get taken down. The next day goes by, it doesn't get taken down. Then I get a call from the guy, uh, and, and he says, hey, we're going to have a meeting. The conference is over now, and we're going to have a meeting on Tuesday. Now, everybody needs Monday off because we put in a hard week's work. Uh, you know, yeah, you're true. showing prejudice to Jews. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard day's work. Of it. <laughs> he said, but I'm going to get the team together and see if maybe we can make a new policy. He said, you know, and he offered, he did offer me my money back. Uh, we had paid $30,000 or something like that for the booth. I hope you and took I, it. No, I told him to keep the money. Really? Yeah. I said, I don't care about the $30,000. I care about my $200 million business that you <laughs> injured. I care about my 250 employees whose jobs you put at risk by using your leadership position in the podcast movement to communicate that our very existence causes harm and that the words that we speak are dangerous and cause pain that will never cease. That's what I'm concerned about. <laughs> Fracking apologize. So he calls me after the conference is over, says, we're going to get together, craft a policy. Maybe we'd like Ben to be on stage with somebody from the left next year. Maybe we'd like you guys to help us with the policy. Or maybe we'll decide in our policy just not to have politics from either side going forward, but one way or the other, we'll let the new policy be our statement. Great. And I said, well, I'd love to work on that policy if you take down <laughs> the offensive <laughs> tweets that call for the annihilation, essentially, the rhetorical annihilation of one of my close friends uh, and business partners and commit to not doing that in the future. I said, and while you're at it, make sure that your apology is just as groveling <laughs> yeah. as the apology that you put out for taking our money. Because a bigot who commits bigotry really should grovel a little bit for all of our forgiveness. Like, that's a thing to actually, uh, that actually causes harm, that actually causes pain. So he says, well, I'm going to call you on Tuesday if you'll hold off on hitting us until Tuesday. And I said, I will. I will hold up. I will let you have your meeting. Don't worry. Backstage is Wednesday. Don't that's worry. That's right. Backstage <laughs> is Wednesday. 
So, <clears throat> so yesterday at 6 p.m. our time, I get a call from the assistant of the man who preemptively blocked me on Twitter, who's the, the president of podcast movement. And she says, you know, the president of the movement would really like to talk to you. Could you get back to us? So we, we returned the call within, probably within a half hour. They got back to us today and said, very much would like to talk to you. Our first availability is September 14th at 3 p.m. <laughs> Stop it. You September, can't. two weeks from now at 3 p.m., I can finally get on the phone with a guy who preemptively blocked me after apologizing for taking my money and saying that the existence, the mere presence uh, of my friend and business partner causes harm. This is, I, again, I've, I've, I said it before, this is a kind of bigotry that could not be expressed against any other kind of person that exists in our country today. And there will be essentially no consequences right. for these sons of bitches. Yeah. <clears throat> they, they'll blow us off. They'll, they'll talk to us in a few weeks and maybe they'll write a policy. The tweets will stay up. There'll be no and, backlash. People and, will and celebrate they've already, lied, they've already lied to you when they said this is not political. This is Lied to yeah. our face yes. saying it's not political. Yeah. And I, I'd like to point out here that, again, there are a lot of podcast companies there. And they are all supposedly in favor of things like open debate. That's and right. Talking about things. And I can guarantee you this. If they had said about, say, John Lovett at Pod Save America, he'd come in and visited the Crooked Booth. That's right. And they had said that his very presence caused harm and therefore he was banned. I would have been openly mocking them, as would you. Of course. Online. We would, have, we would have gone to podcast movement. We would have threatened to take our booth off the floor for that sort of thing. We would have said that we would not co-sponsor the event. As far as I'm aware, zero companies. I think maybe there's one guy, Dan Granger. From Oxford out, Road. From Oxford Road, who put out a statement saying this is unacceptable and ridiculous. Mm. Every, not a single other company, including our companies own... that make tens of millions of dollars That's off right. my show personally. Right, I'm the one whose essence is threatening. That's right. My herbal essence our is own, threatening. Yeah. Our own representatives in this space <laughs> who have made tens of millions of dollars could not be bothered to validate our right, uh, to publicly validate our right to plus, exist. Plus, when they do this to people like, what's that guy, Alex, what's his name? Alex Jones. Alex, Alex, Alex Jones. Jones. The guy's at least a, a loon, whereas you're, you're pretty much a, a conservative. But again, by the way, this isn't I've based on defended, anything Ben said. Right, no. this is correct. I was there. I didn't have a conversation with no, anyone no, about but, politics, but, you but rep- even beyond but that. But you represent, you represent ideas and, uh, and yeah, all that, but those ideas, those ideas are... Uh, central to American thought. They always have been. You've never, you've never come on and said anything that made a, the rest of us like move away. You know, it's just your presence, of course, has. But that's, uh, as, <laughs> as, as I've said, as I've said so before, I am not sure that it's it's bewildering to me on a personal level because you guys all know me. You've known me for years. The the gap between me and the perception of me as highly dangerous human, yeah. and then me in reality is maybe the greatest gap between <laughs> supposed dangerous human and person in reality that I've ever conceived it's your of. But it's it, yeah, it's it's the fact that people listen to the show right. and people watch what we do, and that's what scares the hell out of them. Yeah. And so what they are actively attempting to do now is cast an entire side of the political aisle out of, right. the, of, <clears throat> of the of of the movement, this, and, and, which, and, is, and, which is which is central. And if to there's the not solidarity. Like, I, I, this is so indicative of, th- there were some people online, you know, who aren't part of the podcast movement space, who, you know, Ryan Grimm at The Intercept, who's on the left, or Yashar Ali, who's on the left, who came out and said, this is like insane and ridiculous. Of course. But in the podcast- And, and good on them. Right. Good for them. In the podcast space, where are you guys? Where are you guys? So I'll say this. The day before, the, actually not today, the day, the day this happened, we had a meeting with one of the companies that we do business with. And somebody at that company said, you know what I'd love to do? I would love to broker- like a joint show between you and the people of Pod Save America. And I said to them, that's never going to happen. And the reason it's never going to happen is because th- these people do not want us to be a company that is on the air. They that's do not want our company to exist. I mean, Dan Pfeiffer from Pod Save America literally went on MSNBC and said that we should be quashed because we have too much reach. I- I- I've said many times, I say on my show routinely, I say, if you want to know, people always ask, how do I discern the fact in a, an opinion podcast from the opinion? So what I, and what I always say, literally every time is, listen to my show, listen to Pod Save America, the stuff where we're saying the same stuff, that's the core of fact. Everything else is an opinion takeaway. That's at least a good rule of thumb, okay? So listen to their show. That's right. They would never in a million <laughs> years say that anyone should listen to the show. In fact, they would say that the show should come off the air. And so this, the, the whole predicate of us having a functioning republic is the idea that there are a bunch of people I disagree with who should be allowed at things like, a neutral free speech space like podcast movement. And no one out, literally no one at that event filled with these companies that do free speech for a living. No one, except for Dan, literally no one said a public word to chastise podcast movement for this. That's insane to me. But this is the key. But this is, they they take down libs of TikTok for 
basically putting the left on video. It, it's just holding a mirror up yeah. to what they are. It's the, it's the mirror that does it. When you're a vampire, you don't want to look at it. But you, you hit the nail on the head, Jeremy, which is that they're going after Ben because Ben is the big guy. He's the big dog in the space, and you, you have giant reach, Ben. And so this is what really spooks me about this. You have giant reach because you are as mainstream as it gets. So when they say Ben Shapiro is too far, I say, uh, you ever listen to my show? You ever, you know, are you kidding <laughs> yeah, me? Ben Shapiro is as mainstream as it gets. So what they're really saying is the, the entire right is gone. This is when, when Joe Biden says, listen, some Republicans are good Republicans. But the MAGA Republicans, by which he means any everyone. Republican, <laughs> every, by which he means statistically everyone, other than Bill Kristol and his like four friends who have tea together, you know, 100% statistically of the Republican Party is in a sort of sometimes kind of way a MAGA but, Republicans. But am I yeah. saying There's get a, rid of half the country? There, Here's what, here's what really worries me, like the, the, the combination of things happening, because on one hand, we're be, there's an escalation of, it's not just your opinions that are harmful, it's your very presence, and then we're being told that all MAGA Republicans, which is most Republicans, are extremists and a threat to democracy, for voting is a threat to democracy. Uh, we're being told that if, 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 if conservatives simply speak and present arguments, or, or actually present facts that were terrorists, stochastic terrorists is the phrase now that they like to use, uh, lives at TikTok, as you point out, she got kicked off of Twitter they didn't even give her a reason. They that's just right. said, you're gone. And then on top of that, so that, that's what's happening. And then also, there's another escalation in just the total lack of accountability on the left. And you know, we're sort of used to that, but it's, it seems to be worse now than it's ever been, where there's just, they can do whatever they want. Yep. I mean, I, I've been having this uh, back and forth with this person on, on Twitter who's been like openly um, uh, organizing this drug running operation to, to, to minor children with hormone drugs. Committing felonies. Committing, fel felonies. Committing, committing felonies, breaking probably 50 laws all at once. And, you know, you contact the DEA, you contact everyone you can. Nobody cares. So there's no accountability. All that's happening at once. And then what, is that, what does that do? First of all, it, it, it creates an environment where they're basically setting the stage here to start essentially rounding people up and, I don't know, throwing them in prison. But then on the right, it, it also has this radicalizing effect because people get desperate. Yes. I mean, they're... They're accusing us of being radicals and being dangerous, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's actually what they want, and they're going to create that because people, when they look around and see there's no accountability, these people can do whatever they want to us, the rules don't apply to them, it is radicalizing, it makes people desperate, and desperate people do become dangerous. And it, so, it's, the, it's the end game of something that's been going on for 50, 60 years, though, this idea that we, that they are the... the the people who determine what virtue is, who determine what racism is. I mean, they call they call us racist, not because we're racist. I, I I don't actually know that many racists, but they call us it because we disagree with them. And so, if, if they set the standard, our ideas are the non-racist ideas. If you disagree with us, then ultimately we are going to be well, you know so there's a, basically demonized. Absolutely, a lot of people. One of the things I really loved about this whole episode, the only thing I really loved about this whole episode, is that on Twitter, I must have read. 200 re reactions that were, I guess they're going to start their own podcast movement now. Uh, mm -hmm. Will they call it Jeremy's Podcast Conference? <laughs> like, all of this kind of, like we, we've established a reputation at the Daily Wire as we don't take this stuff lying down and we don't just complain about it, we challenge. And so, you know, a lot of people want to know what we're going to do. It, it took a minute to come up with IHateHarrys.com. Yeah. Like, Jeremy's Razors wasn't like an overnight thing, right? And we're not going to tell you. We're just going to do it. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. not going to tell you. We're just going to do it. But I will say this. Uh, we will not allow podcast movement to continue to, to present itself as a neutral place. If you're a conservative podcaster, they don't want you there. Yeah. If you're a conservative podcaster and you're with any of the major podcasting companies, they don't care to defend you. Yeah. They want to make money off of your success while your, while your political foes try to destroy you. And, by and the then way, they will watch you die when the left finally does land the kill shot and then they will shake their heads, find another conservative talent, and go extract money quietly from them. It's even worse. That's the, that's the game. It's the, the minute, not that they step out of line, this conservative who goes there. Nope. Not, it's the minute they get anywhere near as big as Ben Shapiro. That's the right. minute you're a little too successful, that's when that's you're right. It's, it's also a sign of weakness. I mean, if you guys... Of course it is. If you guys watch Netflix, I mean, Netflix fired a lot of its uh, social justice warriors. But if you watch their their 
the stuff that they say is their top shows. For a while after George Floyd, it was all uh, Black Lives Matter yep. material. And I was sitting there going like, nobody's watching this. They're telling us this is number one, two, three. And then slowly it just vanished. It just yeah. disappeared. And I just thought like, yeah, because, you know, it's it's basically a cent- it's still basically a center right country. Yep. Black people are as conservative as anybody else. The, the uh, uh, Hispanic group, whatever they want to call them now, they're drifting over to the right. They're losing. They are losing the people who have supported them all these years because they're saying, you know, this doesn't represent me. It doesn't represent uh, most people to have their kids told that they're the wrong. But they, but they it might be a center right co- country, but we, our vote doesn't really count culturally. Whereas if you're in a protected class, your vote counts yep. times 10, which is which is another important point here about this, uh, about the podcast conference is that from what I saw, there certainly was, it, it wasn't like they were getting, because Ben showed up, they were getting all this pressure for publicly. People were coming out and blasting them. Nope. I saw one, one person. It was it was right. a trans person, right? I, I think one one it a, person. It was a woman. It was an it was actual. In the tweet, it said uterus. It was a trans. It was a trans man, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well. Whatever. But had a uterus, and so I call that person a woman. <laughs> you monster. I, as as I learned with, from your film. Wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wrong. So one one person that we could tell complained. They're in a protected class. They 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 have the LGBT thing that they can claim, and and because of that one complaint, that's the power that they wield. That's amazing. That's right. The, the, at the time that Podcast Movement put out their groveling, bigoted, bullshit tweet, I believe that that original post had 15 likes. Yep. And I said to the guy on, the, on that first phone call, you chose, you, you made a calculated risk assessment and concluded that the higher risk to your company was to get on the wrong side of mm. a person with 15 likes as opposed to expressing bigotry to a company with 50 million monthly listeners. You made that calculation, but and you pro- he probably isn't wrong. That is where the great risk is, the left, because they are so totalitarian, because they're so unforgiving, because they're so tyrannical right now. But is that a real risk? I mean, what if, what if people just stood up to them? Well, then it would go away. Yeah. <laughs> like anything else, right? That would be the yeah. end of it, which is why the fact that people who actually profit off of us couldn't be bothered uh, to acknowledge our right to exist is the most deeply offensive part of the whole thing. And I will turn this into a promo because it is a direct attack on our business. I mean, we derive a great percentage of our revenue from ads on our shows. That's a big part of how we stay in business. And this is a a direct attack on our ability to function in the podcast ad space. And that's another reason to be grateful to our Daily Wire uh, Plus subscribers. Please go over to Daily Wire Plus, become a subscriber. If you're not one, if you are one, please stick with us. Uh, that, That is the only safe revenue that we have as a company yeah. Uh, is the people who want to be in this fight with us. That's why we're adding things like Members Block. That's why we uh, have been bringing all access back online now that we're recovering from those technical technological deficits that we've had. And there are still a few wrinkles, but it's all, you know, we're, we're moving forward and trying to make this community part of the Daily Wire Plus uh, really come to the fore. Because at the end of the day, it's the, it's the only thing we've got. Even the people who make eight figures a year off of us Will not acknowledge publicly our right to exist. This is this is why this is why the right has ignored their the right ignoring the culture for so long has gotten us into this position. That's right. We're always talking politics, but this is pure culture. It's pure culture that he feels that a fifteen like tweet from some you know protected class person is more dangerous than losing your audience, losing our audience. It's it's an amazing thing what the what happens to the mind when a narrative takes over, when a narrative is is well, promulgated. It's, it's, it's about the right being nice and the right saying we don't want to engage in tactics, we don't want to push, we don't. We, That's right. You no, know, we, we want to be cordial. It's a free market. They can say what they want. Well, here's the thing. If you guys don't push back, then it's asymmetric. It's right. completely asymmetric. Yeah. It means that they they do, in a certain sense, have more to fear. From the until, until we existed, until Daily Wire existed, they did have more to fear from the idiot with 15 followers on Twitter than they did from multi-million dollar or even billion dollar conservative companies yeah. because those That's conservative correct. companies would just sit back there and they would take it. They would sit there and they'd say, okay, well, you know, we exist at your sufferance. We understand we exist at your sufferance. And so, you know, we understand what you're doing. We get it. We get that they're mean and they're nasty. We're over here. We're nice. But you know what? Screw that. That's right. Okay, because the reality is that we're not nice anymore. If, if you're going to <laughs> seek to destroy us, then we are not going to sit here and be destroyed. That is not yeah. something that I, I do not acquiesce to the erasure of my own existence. That is not something to, I'm sorry, but I, I like existing. I'm addicted to breathing. There are certain things I'm not willing to do. And not existing is one of the things I am not willing to do.
But we don't even and, have to. We don't even have to fight at their level. We all we have to do is speak out without fear, because the things that we say make sense to most people. And I, I think that that's that's the whole. Like cowards problem. need to be punished. What's that? Cowards need to be punished. Cow- yeah. right. And we need to we need to mobilize too. That, the the, the yeah. good news I think is that people on the right are hungry to mobilize and to get out. I hear this from people all the time. Like they they're ready. They want to get out. They want to do something. That's one of the reasons why they they love the Daily Wire so much is that we are out there doing things. Um, so that's the good news. But they they need a, they need an outlet. I mean, that's one thing. The left also they own the culture. They're much much better at mobilizing. Uh, if they're upset about something, they're going to show up, and you know they are. The right is, is, is much more reticent to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we could show up at the Podcast Movement Conference next year and have 10,000 people picketing or whatever. Shh, we agreed not to talk oh, about it. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically, I'm just saying, you, you, don't, you don't want your, your thing to be political. Well, we can make it real political, make it more political right. than you ever. We could do that. So it's just, that's... Th- there is that, that hunger to really... To really For a long time, there was a strain on the right where the right wanted to lose. If we were going to lose, we were going to lose with dignity. You oh, know, we're just going to we're gonna step back and lose with dignity. And I think what you realize from that tweet thread from Pod- Podcast Movement, what you realize from them saying, yeah, Ben Shapiro shouldn't exist, that's not very dignified. That doesn't yeah. feel... And so I have no interest in losing. I don't want to lose in an undignified way. You know what I'd rather do? I'd rather win right. with <laughs> dignity and honor and, that's, and winning. And that's why the Daily Wire is committed to building alternatives. Because at the end of the day... One of the reasons that the right has gone along with this is because what else are you going to do? You still need a razor. Well, now, you know what? Now you don't. If you're still shaving with a razor from a razor company that hates you, you're doing that by choice. You're not doing that because you don't have alternatives. If you're still getting your news from news companies that hate you, you're doing that. You've decided to do it. You have an alternative. We and others are providing. That's why we're launching into this kids' content so that you don't have to put your kids in front of what the left wants to serve them up. So we're launching entertainment. Who knows what we'll launch next? Other people need to jump into this space. There are a few, of course, Dan Bongino and others in this parallel economy space. But we, we have to create economic incentive to move. Because at the end of the day, podcast movement is just a business. It's a business that has made a risk calculation. I want them to reevaluate that risk calculation. And I want to make all of these. I think to have a free country, you have to have a largely neutral economic sphere. The, the, the economic sphere needs to be a play. Like, you don't need to have to think about the politics of your toilet paper company. If you do, it is a real sign that your country is in trouble. And until we have Jeremy's toilet paper company or, <laughs> or Dan Bongino's, to- I think I'll let Dan I'll, I'll, I'll look forward, I'll look Bongino, forward to that, actually, Jeremy. Bongino foreplay. <laughs> uh, but until we have these things, we can't create the conditions for the left. I can express a lot of hostility of Jeremy's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'll be rough. <laughs> so rough. Well, folks, you know, I, this has all been rather a downer, and, and I have some even worse <laughs> news for you. When it comes to life, nobody gets out alive. And what that means is that you need life insurance. You know, God forbid you're walking down the street, and suddenly one of Joe Biden's F-15s just strikes you. <laughs> and you want to make sure that your family is taken care of. You know, we pay hundreds of dollars per year to protect our homes, our cars, even our phones. Too many of us aren't taking steps to protect our families, finances, mortgage payments, private student loans, other types of debt don't just disappear. Well, maybe student loans. If something happens, to you, a life insurance policy can provide your loved ones a financial cushion they can use to cover those costs, and it can provide you with peace of mind that even in worst case scenario, they will be protected. Policy Genius is an insurance marketplace that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies in one place. You can find your lowest price on life insurance. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Options start at just $17 per month for $500,000 of coverage. Just head on over to policygenius.com to get personalized quotes in minutes. You can find the right policy for your needs. And the licensed agents of Policy Genius will work with you and for you, not the insurance companies. They're on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options so you can make the right decision with confidence. Head on over to policygenius.com, get your free life insurance quotes, see how much you could save. So we've talked a lot about the threat that we represent, obviously, (laughs) in the world, uh, but we haven't talked about the great uh, the great uh, savior of the country against threats like ours, and that's, of course, our fearless and absolutely still cogent president, Joe Biden, <laughs> who, who has declared us all uh, to be renegades and scoundrels well, we're and to be bombed from the air. <laughs> which is like, we're, semi, we're semi-fascist, right? Which is like yeah. a quasi-Nazi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not, Nazi-adjacent not, is how not, we would like say Quasi-Nazi like Nazi has a ring to it. Quasi-Nazi, quasi-Nazi yeah. 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 So he says that we are a threat to democracy itself. We're also a threat to the future of human existence. He said that mm-hmm. because of climate change, of course, which makes us somewhere between Hitler and Thanos, <laughs> uh, which is exciting <laughs> stuff. I mean, the, the, the phenomenal cosmic power we wield is just beyond compare. Um, and I think Gina Carano was actually canceled by Disney for comparing Thanos to Hitler. I don't remember all the. I, I don't remember all. Uh, in all in the any details. case, you know, there, there was something that uh, that 
struck me when, when I heard Joe Biden suggesting that those who oppose him are semi-fascist. And that is, these people, they, they, people are so ignorant. And when they hear fascist, they just hear Hitler. And when they think of Hitler, they just think of the worst thing that Hitler did, the Holocaust. And so what Joe Biden means when he says semi-fascist is that you want to perform holocausts or something. Yeah. Okay, but when you actually think about the history of fascism, typically fascism begins with the usurpation of massive centralized power and executive authority free of legislative oversight. So I started thinking, can I think of any recent example <laughs> of massive usurpations of executive authority, mm. unconstitutional usurpations, you know, th things where people say, I don't actually have the power to do that. And then they just go ahead and do it. Like, say, I don't know, $500 billion in student loan relief that you said one year ago you did not have the power to do. The single largest expenditure by the executive branch via an executive order in the history of the United States. Right. I mean, it would be... I could see why Joe Biden might forget about that since it was four days ago. And Joe Biden <laughs> He's has, tried to ride a bicycle since then. That's true. He does have the memory of a guppy. But the, the, the fact that we are all supposed to believe that true fascism lies in, in resisting the centralizing impulse of a, a federal government that has over the course of the last year and a half declared on an emergency basis that you all have to vax, that you don't have to pay your mortgage, you won't be evicted, and that we can get rid of all of your student loan debt. That you can do all of that on the back of emergency declarations it, it's so historically ignorant, and he, he counts on, on our ignorance, to suggest that it's fascist to oppose that. When again, the very nature of fascism, what people don't understand, if you actually want to look at the history of Hitler, centralized power in a dictatorship existed pre-Hitler in Germany. Right. By 1930, Heinrich Brüning, who was the chancellor of Germany at the time, was operating under Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, which is an emergency declaration making the legislature essentially an adjunct to all policymaking in the Reich. And then it was just a matter of time until the really bad guy took over using that authority. But that's been the pattern in the United States since Barack Obama said in 2014 he was just going to act as the pen and the phone if he didn't control Congress. So if you're, if you're looking at threats to the American system and threats to democracy, you might want to start with the doddering old fool in the White House who can't string together two sentences out of his doddering stupid face hole. But this you, is what you, you know, see the, the op-ed in the New York Times by the Harvard and Yale uh, law professors yes. call, calling for the end of the Constitution for the simple reason that it got in the way of their brilliant ideas. And they said, we've got to get rid of judicial review because we've got to be able to pass laws, you know, permitting abortion and controlling energy without this stupid Constitution stuff getting in our way. Now, you know, that would be one thing if it was a 17-year-old, you know, right. saying, I don't want daddy telling me what I can't do. But a Harvard and a Yale professor, that's genuinely... I, I gotta say, my favorite thing about that is that they have controlled the direction of the judiciary. Yeah. Since until like 19, ago. since yeah. like 1960, basically, and they like a string of uninterrupted successes from the left in the judiciary for 50 odd years. They lose one decision in Dobbs. <laughs> and they're like, that's it. It's almost judicial <laughs> review. Obliterate the institution. It's over, guys. Since when is the Constitution getting in their way anyway? So <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, if only. But it could. It could. That's but you know, when, when Biden said that, and when Corinne Jean Pierre at the White House doubled down on it, that we're all fascists. My first instinct was. I would bet my life savings that neither Karine Jean-Pierre nor Joe Biden have, forget about red, they've never even heard of the doctrine of fascism, the, the Mussolini essay that defines what fascism is. They would, I, have, I studied history and Italian at college. The one thing you, I think you have to study if you do both of those <laughs> things is you have to study what fascism is. They've certainly never read that. They've never read the, the early fascist manifesto by the, the founder of Futurism actually wrote it. They've never heard it. They don't have any idea what fascism means. Mm -hmm. Fascism to them, and George Orwell made this point, fascism to the left means something I don't like. <laughs> it's whatever I don't like. And if I don't like it, then you are, forget Mussolini, you're Hitler and you're a Nazi and we're going to treat you like we would treat Hitler and the Nazis and you have absolutely no right to speak in our public square. That's all it means. So they'll change the definition like they change the definition of every other word. They change the definition of the word woman. Does, all it means is we are going to shut you up and we are going to push you out of politics. And then they say, well, you know, what we want is unity. Right, tomorrow we're going to get Joe Biden's big unity speech on the heels of <laughs> half the country semi-fascist. Yeah. He literally says that. We get, we're gonna, he's going to speak to the soul of the country. Well, first of all, I think his soul left his body quite a while ago. So it's going to be amazing to watch. He is, he is proof positive that resurrection does exist mm -hmm. because he's been dead for quite a while and yet he's still ambulatory <laughs> in some way. They, they do want unity. I, I actually don't think that that's... Uh... Right, through purges. Right, well, they, so they want... They want we, we have right now, ideologically, this vast canyon that separates us and it's not, it's not bridgeable. There's no compromise area between it. So the only way to have unity is for one side to either just throw itself into the canyon and die or, or to join, you know, to join the other side. So that's, that's the kind of unity they want is just we're obliterated by either, either assuming ourselves with them or just 
dying or whatever. I had a really, they want. I had a sad thought yesterday because Gorbachev died. You know, the last leader uh, of the yeah. Soviet Union. He was 91. And I had this thought. I said, Gorbachev, what can we learn from history? I said, there's some parallels here. You got a very old, a dead guy. So, okay, Soviet Union. I'm thinking of my own president right now. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it came to prominence in politics in the 70s. Okay. Palled around with actual communists. Okay. This is right now checking out Gorby and Biden. Uh, they presided over the decline and fall of their nations and empires. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing a whole lot of parallels here, except for one. Gorbachev tried to make his country freer and more transparent. <laughs> that was the, the only, di- and, and he was sort of likable and friends with Ronald Reagan. I thought, gosh, 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, how on earth do we, the people who won the Cold War, how do we find ourselves in this really awful political, do we learn nothing from the Cold War? It is really interesting that we defeat people and then take on their characteristics. Mm-hmm. It's really yeah. interesting that we start out, I mean, the, the Holocaust started with euthanasia. You know, it started with killing off uh, people who were uh, crippled or uh, mentally ill and all this stuff. And now we have actual headlines that say, you know, we've gotten rid of a syndrome through abortion. Yeah. You go like, good job. They're doing it in Canada. They're pushing right now. 3.3% of deaths in Canada in 2021 were euthanasia, doctor-assisted suicide. Yeah. And, and there's a bill. 3.3%? 3.3% of all deaths. It's, by the way, it's going to spike way higher yeah. than that. And th- right now in October, they're pushing for a bill that will legalize euthanasia. Euthanasia, it's assisted suicide for children. And what children are they going to kill? You know right. they're going to kill the weakest children, the ones with problems, the ones with disabilities. You just think... Wh- and, and it's all going to be done with a smile, happy, happy. From and they're Justin suggesting Trudeau. it too. They had there was a, a, they had a, a veteran that called the the VA, and they suggested to him, "Oh, have you thought about euthanasia?" <laughs> they're, they're they're actually like promoting it as yeah. an option. My, if you know, feeling, if you're feeling down. I mean, the, years this ago. is the, this is the thing that I think people forget, and this was Jonah Goldberg's point in liberal fascism, which is that nobody actually shows up at the front door making the case for fascism wearing the shiny boots. The shiny boots come later. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, right. It starts with all of the happy promises and all the wonderful things we can do with you. We can make your life easier. If you just get rid of these moral standards here and these moral standards there, your life becomes significantly more convenient. If you don't have to listen to that guy on the other side of the aisle, your life is just going to be richer and better. And, and you know, the, all this stuff is messy. It makes it a lot less messy if you just give us the power to push, do whatever we want. I'm going to push back on you just slightly. I don't think it's if you give up this moral standard and that moral standard. I think it's if you accept this moral standard, right. mm. like it always comes in the guise of a higher morality. Mm-hmm. Like it's actually wrong of you to want what you want that veteran to suffer. Yeah. You want children born with Down syndrome to have to live. Yeah. Im- imagine, imagine how hard it is for them to be alive. I mean, that, and but their they, families to take care of. And their families take care of. They, fr- they frame all of this in a way that makes it seem like a virtuous thing. You're going to let Ben Shapiro who disagrees with us, you're going to let him speak and cause emotional distress. Or you're going to let kids with gender dysphoria kill themselves. You know, like kids with, yeah, you, you, just want, you just want to erase trans but it, but it's But it always comes back to the idea, I think you're right, though, it comes back to the idea of having a hierarchy of values. That, you know, what do you, what, what do you mean that a homosexual marriage isn't the same thing as a, a straight marriage? What do you mean when you say being fat is less attractive than, than being fit. What, do you, what, what are you talking about? That you should have some kind of value system where you value things, natural things, uh, more than others. And I think that is actually an elimination of moral difference. And I, all think, I actually do think it comes out of the idea that we can all get together, uh, we can all have our own religions, uh, and they're all going to be equal. That's not, you know, it's one thing to be religiously tolerant, which of course I'm for, but it's another thing to say that no religion is better than any other, which is absurd. It's just absurd. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, and people actually make the argument. It's really wild. How can you say that there that one religion is true and there are so many religions? It's like easy. I, one is true, and the others aren't. You know? <laughs> it's like, there, I said, as, I there's said, so many <laughs> answers to the math problem. How can only one be true? Exactly, exactly. You know, so I, I think there is this kind of elimination of values, and it's put in in terms of the fact that if you hold to values, people suffer, which is true. I mean, it is. It's. Uh, I think it's a very unpleasant thing to be fat. I think that people who are fat feel a tremendous amount of shame. They blame the shame on us, but it's there to begin with. And it, and it is, it's, but it's incredibly unhealthy and incredibly shameful and shaming, self-shaming and an incredibly bad way to live. But just to say it is what makes you an evil person. To say that there's a hierarchy of values is what makes you an evil person. Well, I think that one of the things that they've done, and I'm thinking this through in real time, is they've made the core of human behavior the the emotion you feel in response to the human behavior. That's the thing that we're supposed to focus in on. And so that means that the behavior is really secondary. So if you feel pain because you're overweight, 
And then it really doesn't matter whether you're overweight because you choose not to stop eating or whether you're overweight because you have an actual genetic anomaly yep. that makes you fat. The pain is the same. And so therefore, we cannot tell people that they should exercise because if we do that, well, you're ignoring the pain. And, and so the, the core is always the emotional response. It's not the behavior that leads to the emotional response. And so that's, that's just a difference in kind between how I think religious people who, who see cause and effect in the world and people who don't believe in cause and effect and only care about the emotional state in, in which you find yourself that's just two different ways of, of viewing the world. And if, if all you're focused in on is the emotional state of people at all times, regardless yeah. of the behavior that leads to the emotional state, number one, you're depriving people of their agency because the truth is that you can, in fact, in many cases, control your emotional state. That's what it's called to become an adult. I mean, you've- you, Discipline, patience, you know. I mean, yes. I mean, the, looking at, so the, the Bible very rarely, the Old Testament, very rarely commands emotion, right? It commands the action. But there are certain times where the Bible literally commands emotion. It says that you have to love God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your means, right? So what does it mean when God says, I want you to love? Or, or when, when God says, I want you to love your neighbor as your child? What, what is that actually supposed to mean? That he can, how can you command somebody else to feel something? So that says, you can't. There's no way because you can't change your emotional state. Nothing you do can change your emotional state. And, the, and what religion typically teaches is fake it until you make it essentially, yeah. right? Treat other people as you would wish to be treated and you will end up loving your neighbor as yourself. It right? is an, that's, that's the basic It's an absolute certainty that if you are sitting in a movie theater watching a scary movie and you become afraid, if you turn on the light and take your eyes off of the screen, your fear will mitigate because emotions are controlled by externalities. It doesn't mean that every emotion, this is this whole cause and effect and we've talked about it on this show before, that some things can start in the physical and then infect the spiritual and some things can start in the spiritual and then manifest in the physical like that's a that door swings both ways for sure so you can have fear that isn't caused by an externality certainly but in many 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 instances you can have your fear can be caused by the externality and you can have irrational feelings i mean I think of course you that can of course you observe i, I think you can fear, fear at a scary movie is actually an irrational of course it is of an course irrational you, you volunteered and that's what you're there for and, that's you know, right. but, but it's also true that like as as you get, I think, a little wiser, you start to look at your life and think like, well, I feel this way, but that's not really that's the, the state. the entire basis of the only area of psychology that has actually been proved over time to be effective, cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes, yes. Cognitive behavioral therapy is about the idea that you have an emotional response to a stimulus, and maybe that's an irrational and unreasonable response to the stimulus, and you need to change the way that you're responding to the stimulus. That idea in itself is offensive to the left. And yeah. so what that means, again, because they focus in on the emotional state, this is how you end up with the right will say things like, wait, you took out a debt, and now you're pissed off because you can't pay back your college debt. That's your fault. You shouldn't have taken out a college debt that you couldn't pay. Yeah. And maybe somebody was predatory and that person should be punished. But if you take out a debt and you can't pay the debt, that's not my fault. That's not somebody else's By fault. By the way, they keep saying that the student loans are predatory, but they offer absolutely no solutions for how to get rid of them. <laughs> right. right? Only, only forgive them and keep the, and keep the system. The, the, on the emotion thing, though, the, the piece that we're missing, because, yeah, they, they say emotion matters the most. That's, that's, that takes primacy. If they applied that across the board, it would still be bad, but it wouldn't be nearly as bad as the actual situation, which is that what they're really saying is that emotions are, have pr primacy for, for some people, yeah. but then if you're in the out group, your emotions don't matter at all. They don't give a damn how you feel. Uh, you could be in the utter you know, depths of despair and it doesn't matter. That's why I ask this question all the time about the women's locker room debate. And they tell us, well, the trans person, they're, how, they're, how are they going to feel if they're not allowed in the women's <laughs> locker room? And then usually the response from the right is about all the, well, what about safety? What about this? I always respond, well, what about the emotions of the women? How what about how they feel? And what you find is that, oh, their emotions don't matter at all. Who cares they, about uh, them? Yeah. They're but biggest. that's just, a, they just have a phobia. Right, exactly. <laughs> which, makes you know, it, which makes you think that maybe in the end, it's all just, as always, a power game for the left. Yeah, of course. The, the, of course. the emotional veneer is all just... But, but, we, we almost in the power, but in the power... The jackboot is behind the smiley face, right? We're, the smiley face is the pitch. The jackboot is what's really... We're behind. almost... We're making it... We, we almost sometimes make it make it sound like they have an overabundance of empathy. They, they <laughs> which is what they, which much, what they want us to think. Yeah. Right. But that's, that's not it at all. I think they don't care. This is not empathy. This, and, is, this is, I think, power. And the power game obscures the fact that they are erasing truths, central truths about human nature that have been handed down to us, you know, through long centuries of wisdom. And, you know, we're really talking about is we're talking about the flesh and the spirit. You know, you're talking about the fact that your flesh feels things that your yes. spirit knows are false. You know, right. your, your flesh feels envy and then you sit and think about it and think, well, do I really want my friend to fail? No, I actually want my friend to, to succeed. My flesh maybe ha has this kind of, you know, instant response. Do I really want to sleep with that woman and destroy my family? Actually, no, I, I actually you know, don't, but I, my flesh feels And that. this is where the cultural echo chamber really, that you're talking about, really matters so unbelievably much because 
what they do is a path to unhappiness. It is a path to misery yes. for millions yes. and millions of people. I, I cut a video this week about Demi Lovato's new album. And, for, you know, this is not my area of expertise. I'm not a Demi Lovato fanatic. Oh, I don't listen to this kind of music. As I said uh, on the show, it's not that I'm a cultural snob. It's just I don't like shit. <laughs> but the, but, the, the, but the, the, the real problem is that if you actually listen to her album, it's actually, it's actually quite sad. I, I actually feel terrible for this person, like really feel terrible for this person. This is a person who alleges that she was raped at the age of 15 when she was on a set. She, her parents were divorced when she was two. She was put on TV at the age of 10. She was being dated when she was 17 by a man of 29. And she was in rehab by the time she was 17 years old. Hey, this is a person who has led an absolutely misery-ridden life. And her entire new album, which is titled unsurprisingly, holy F, right? That, that, and, and the cover is a picture of her in bondage gear on a cross-shaped couch, right? She's, it, it's her just taking Madonna's routine. <laughs> but the whole idea of the album, she sings about being victimized when she's 17. She has a whole song about her being 17, how terrible that felt. And she has these songs about how it's terrible that she's a drug addict and she's had to yeah. fight that and all these things. But the entire album is geared at the evils of traditional morality, yeah. the one thing that yeah. she's never actually tried or been, or been trained in or, or actually involves herself in to the plaudits of the media. And so the point that I was making is that what the media do, they, they churn out misery. And then in order to alleviate your misery, they reward you for becoming an, a messenger of the misery. Right? You attack the system you've never actually tried yeah. as the thing that's held you back. And the thing that actually has held you back, this if you is, champion it, we will reward you. This is a form of porn that the New York Times op-ed page has now brought to yeah. absolute perfection. <laughs> Whereas it's usually a woman, but uh, sometimes a man, but it says, my life has been an absolute misery, it's, and it's I defend so and I defend to the death my yeah. right to have been this miserable. It, I mean, you know, and, and we see it, our pal, Bridget Phetasy, who wrote a very touching Fabulous art, art, piece, uh, piece mm -hmm. about... And she was sorry for being a slut. But even in that piece, she says, I'm not saying we should go back to Victorian era or the, or the uh, 1950s. I would just tell my younger self, if you cherish yourself, then someone will cherish you. I thought, well, that's what a woman in the 1950s would have told her daughter <laughs> to, you know, so maybe, maybe they were just right. This is know? the power of practice, though. And it's why I think we've got to be a little careful about this neutral language because not, some things can't be neutral. You know, you, if, if uh, you call the, the great example is you call the girl she or you call the girl he, and it, that, that is not neutral. There's no neutral ground. You're, you're making a moral claim there. And there's this idea, it's lex orandi, lex credendi, the way that we worship, the way that we, and really- You're French. I know, you know, it's classic <laughs> Arabic. Uh, so the, the way that we worship affects the way that we believe. And so these people who have been just trained in these rituals of, of leftism, liberalism, whatever you want to call it, they're trained in it. They know that it's making them miserable. The practices that have defined their lives have ruined their lives. They'll even admit it in a way in the paper, but they can't change the belief. Change. That is the power because we have bot we are bodies in many ways. And so the, the things that we do every single day, our behaviors every day, are going to affect the way that we believe. It's why we don't always succeed when we make total, we rarely succeed actually, when we make totally rational arguments for why our way is better than well, their way. Also, it doesn't matter. They got to do uh, it. We also don't realize the tribal nature of some of this stuff. There's, there's a, my, my favorite op-ed writer right now is this woman in the Times named Michelle, Michelle Goldberg. <laughs> because Michelle Goldberg is constantly discovering that everything she believes is wrong, <laughs> and then by the end of the column saying, oh, but it's all true, you know? So she, fi she suddenly finds out that, like, maybe maybe the sexual revolution wasn't such a good thing. But, yeah, I'm not but saying... I'm not saying, Yeah, but it was great. You shouldn't stop. You know, the other day she wrote my, my favorite, one of my favorite of her columns, which is, art is now boring. That's absolutely true. We've hit an absolute low in the culture. In my lifetime, this is the lowest the culture has been because of woke, because their values don't aren't conducive to art, because they're not conducive to life. But she then starts quoting Karl Marx. You know, this is all explained. And I thought, like, yeah, OK, <laughs> I, I know the rest of this column. Oh, know? yeah, no, there's a, there, my, my favorite recent piece in The New York Times, as long as we're doing favorite recent pieces in The New York Times. <laughs> yeah. There's a woman who wrote this whole article about, I'm in a progressive marriage. Yes. It was an open marriage. And I was miserable. Yes. I was just miserable. It was the worst marriage ever. But that just demonstrates that progressive marriage is actually a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's, and we need to get past the morality of the past. Great. And it's, it, it, there's so much of this on the left. And that's why there's a study today that came out. And it's a study that every sentient human being knew was going to be true, which is that religious people have better sex. Yeah, right? There's a study that says religious people have better sex. They, particularly women have a more meaningful sexual life when they are in a, a long-term relationship with a person who shares their values, <laughs> which is the least shocking piece of news that has ever been broken <laughs> yep. upon the American people, ever, mm -hmm. ever. And it, it, was, it held true for men as well. Religious men 
tend to have better sex because it is in the context of a relationship that is actually fulfilling. And it turns out married people actually have a fair bit of sex because they actually know the person that they're having sex with. <laughs> yeah. They do it fairly regularly, as it turns out. And you don't have to go shopping for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so the, this entire study is written in the, in the realm of almost like Jeff... Jeff Corwin, like in, in Australia, and he's going around in the outback, like, why would... <laughs> it's Steve Irwin, he's like, Crikey, oh, we're looking Crikey, at the what's... <laughs> these, these people, yeah, like, bunnies, I can't believe it. And, it's, and, and you're like, well, I mean, this, but this makes perfect sense. Why, why do you think, even if you're not a religious person, let's, let's assume that you have a naturalistic explanation for religion. Okay, then why do you think these religious rituals if, began in the first place? And the answer is they're outgrowths of evolutionary biology, even if you're an atheist. Because human beings are naturally driven toward a life of meeting. Women are naturally driven toward mating with people who are very specific so they can propagate their line with not the schmo down the block. <laughs> and men tend to be driven toward polygamy. But if they are forced by circumstance, and namely by women, into monogamy, they tend to lead healthier sex lives than people who are just out screwing whatever is available. And yeah, but, but that's, that's part of the trade-off. Right, it, this, this is right. And so, the, but the fact that, that we keep, there's so many, Christine Emba at the yes, Washington yes. Post, she keeps writing pieces about like, well, you know, it seems like the consent values that we've been promoting my entire lifetime, they're not sufficient. There are so many women who are consenting and then they regret and is really consent enough? And it's like, where have you been? Where have you been? <laughs> Can I recommend this thing? It rhymes with marriage. It's, 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 we've had it for literally forever. And, and, and it, it's just- I don't want to tell a tale out of school, but uh, my friends and I, some male friends and I back in my wayward youth, we were discussing this one day and we had this kind of epiphany. We said, you know, you know, fellas, I think, I just thought about this the other day. I think sex actually is better with people that you know. <laughs> oh, and, and like, furthermore, and like, it's even better with people that you like. And we're sitting there like, wow. And I'm, I'm not, I'm being somewhat, you know, hyperbolic here, but those are the exact words we said. And we, th we thought about that, like an actual epiphany. And then yeah, we, thought, yeah. we thought, you know, Maybe every person ever throughout history knew this, except for us. <laughs> no, like maybe this, we're is, this the, is the battle. This was the hinge of my life. This was the hinge <laughs> of my life. I was walking down the street one day, and I said, you know what? I'm not sleeping with women I don't like anymore. I'm not going to pretend to like women I don't like. Within six months, I met the woman who became my wife. Within six, first of all, within six months, I was having the greatest dating experiences of my life, because <laughs> I just thought, I'm not going out with women I, like these I don't people. like. You know, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then within six months, I met the woman. It's, not just, you, it's not just that you like the person, too. It's also you're having sex with someone and you can embrace the totality of the act and all of its consequences and see yeah. those things not as a, not not as this there's this thing that must be feared but as a, as a great blessing yeah, yeah. so that that's another part that that allows us is, to enjoy it quite a bit more this is the purpose. thing about the you mentioned the flesh and the spirit a little bit ago you mentioned you know people have certain people have genetic predispositions towards being overweight and other people uh, have eating disorders and et cetera, et cetera. all of this is sort of one thing which is that in the battle between flesh and spirit you're being fed two ideas all the time. And the one idea is always a lie. And the, so it's like you're, the fear of your spirit is a lie and the promise of joy of the flesh is a lie. And so I, I've talked to, because we obviously, we've never had an obese society before until right now. Yeah. Like you, look, you look at pictures from the beach in 1968, no one was overweight. And when I mean not overweight, People who we think of as not overweight now would have been considered overweight then. They didn't so have seed even, oils. That's why. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. It's not <laughs> even. It's not even that they were. Side note, by the way, have you noticed that the sizes are changing? I'm talking about like clothing sizes. Oh yeah. yeah, they're changing. Like it's bizarre. Over the course of my lifetime, okay, like I, I'm five nine and I weigh about one sixty, which puts me normally in the medium category. And now I'm having to wear smalls because the mm. mediums are for giants. <laughs> right, they're for oh, giants. They, they, I thought I was losing weight. This is, <laughs> this is definitely happening, but. The, the point I'm making is that I've had to have conversations with people about the fact that almost no one is overweight because of, because of hormones and genetics. Yeah. And they don't believe you. So you're just wrong. I've had to have conversations with people who I, who I have true affection for about the fact that most of the mental illness that we're dealing with is inflicted, not biological. Yeah. And my evidence of it is it's brand new. It's never existed before. All of this is because, on one hand, in most hand, places right now, by the way, not terribly. Even right now, most people aren't overweight in the world. Even right now, most people in the world don't have mental illnesses, among other things. If you, if you believe the flesh, then you think. So, so I, I did hardcore keto right for a while, and I've never felt better. I've never been in better shape. It requires some discipline. It requires routines. That's a big part of how you accomplish it. 
we move to Nashville. All of my routines are broken. All of my discipline falls apart. All the places where I knew how to get the food that would still taste good, but you know, like you, you've sort of solved it. All that goes away, and there are biscuits literally everywhere. Like, <laughs> the under this sidewalk. chair right now, there are biscuits. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I've gained 12 pounds. I feel worse. Every few days, I start trying to go back to the thing that I know made me feel better. And every few days, I'm tempted by the things that make me feel worse. Mm-hmm. And in the moment, the things that make me feel worse come with the promise of joy. The milkshake promises to make me feel better. The funny thing is it makes me feel worse immediately. I don't just feel like guilt. I actually feel bad from the sugar, bad from the dairy. Uh, And nevertheless, that temptation is real. This is every single thing that we deal with in life. Sex with a waitress is always better than sex with your wife, except that sex with your wife is always better than sex with the waitress. It's not that one thing is true and the other is false. It's that both things possess in themselves a kind of truth, it's, it's almost, but only one of them is true, is fundamentally It's true, almost right? as if there's a conscious power trying to destroy us. You know? <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, with personality. I, I, yeah, I don't know. You, you know, people write into my show constantly. I would say this is the most frequent question I get on the show. It's from young Why do you have a show? Yeah. And it's, yeah, Michael, why, why is still Ben employed, still yeah. permitting this? Sign Ben. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ben, why do, you, why do we let him into all access? The, uh, the question I get more than any other is from young men who say, I'm addicted to porn. And yes, yeah, I get that all the time. I get it constantly, yeah. right? And it's, yeah, this one too, actually. The thing, this is the biggest one because now we have these portals to hell in our pockets right. and it's brand new really of the last 20 years. But it, it really can be applied to any addiction or yeah, any of kind of vice or any temptation. And they'll write in and they, in, in near desperation, they'll write in and say, is there any way to get better? Is there any way to recover some lost innocence? That was a, a question last week. Is there any way to, and the answer is, if you've ever disciplined yourself or recovered from any sort of addiction or anything, you'll, you'll know the answer is yes, eventually. There is, you actually can get better. You actually, the temptation can go away a little bit. You can get, and it's because virtue and vice are habits. They're not just, we like to, we're in the eternal present, so we want instant gratification. That's mm-hmm. not how it works. When you have routine, when you have habits in virtue, then the temptation gets to be a little less to vice and it's easier to do the virtue. And the, then you go back to the biscuits and then all of a sudden it's harder to go back to the keto and it's easier also, to keep the biscuits. In, in order to actually do this sort of stuff, you have to have a realistic assessment of your own limitations. And this is something that society actively mocks. Mm. Yeah. If, you, if you say, for example, like Mike Pence, you know what, I'm not going to have dinner with a woman who's not my wife yeah. in a room with a closed yep. door. You are a bigot. You are a ridiculous person because what, you think you're just going to have sex with her? What do you think? You're just going to cheat on your wife just like that? Is that really what you think? That it's just, so you, you mock the notion that you have to set up prophylactic rules, which is what most of life is, setting up prophylactic rules around the innate fallen nature of, of yourself. And this is true of, of literally everything. You have to set up these prophylactic rules around the things that you care about so that you never come within 100 yards of actually violating the thing that, that you care about. And society mocks this. There's a, a section of the Talmud that's actually quite wonderful about essentially what I think is pornography addiction, really, uh, where it's talking about, it says it's a sin for you to walk near a river and see women bathing, but, or to, it's, it's, it's a sin where to walk near a river where women are bathing and avert your eyes. And so it's like, well, why, why is it a sin to, to avert your eyes? It's not. It's a sin that you went near the river in the first place. Mm, yeah. Because you're putting yourself in a position of temptation. Occasion of, all of occasion society of sin. Is design, yeah. All of society is designed, they keep saying this over and over. It, it's, it's a mantra of the left. Well, I mean, if you can't resist the temptation, was it really worth resisting? What kind of person? Are you really so weak that you can't resist the temptation? Yes. I mean, it, yes, I, yes, yeah, I yeah, am yes, in yeah. any case. And, and yeah. so we used to have a society constructed around the idea that you had to create all of these fences in order to prevent a lot of people from falling into the chasm. And then we we're like, well, you know what? It, it, it's not really going to change your life if we get rid of those fences, is it? And a lot of people start falling into the well. I mean, it's not a shock. You also and have to... The of sin is, is one of the great pieces of advice yeah. like, ever. Yeah. And I, when I get this question about pornography addiction, the, the first thing I say is, well, if you want to beat the pornography addiction, stop calling it an addiction. Hmm. Because, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that word in and of itself, the, there might be a sense in which it's true, but what, what that has come to mean is a disease. And when we say disease, we mean something you don't have any control over. So you need, you need someone else, you need someone else to come in and you're, you're basically powerless to stop it. It's not, it's not an addiction. It's a, it's a compulsion. It's a habit. I mean, that's bad what habit. it is. It's a bad habit and habits have a lot of power over you, but you can still, you still have your free will. You're able to make a choice. And so every time you look at the pornography, you are making a choice to do it. And I think when you talk, when you think of it like an addiction, then you, 
it gives you an out. It's sort of like, well, it's not my choice. It's it's the addiction. It's but isn't that true with the one step? You're one step down though, because it is it is an addiction, but an addiction is not a disease. Mm. I mean, if you could give up cancer, you you would. That's what a disease <laughs> yeah, yeah, looks yeah. like, you know. For Lent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you can you can beat it. I mean, the only thing I've ever been actually addicted to is cigarettes. And you beat it. You just beat it, and you yeah. curl up in a ball, and it's awful. It is an awful experience. I do want. I do want to say, like the apostles, clear the things I don't want to do. I do yeah, the things yeah. I want to do. I scarcely ever do. I don't think it's as simple as saying that everyone can simply choose I, I, uh, to overcome any expression of sin. That's not true. We had a society with more uh, condoms. I didn't understand exactly what you were saying before, but <laughs> in the past we had a society. There were condoms everywhere. The biscuits on the condoms. Biscuits, biscuits, I don't know. Uh, and we had a society that had a lot of rules meant to prevent the occasion of sin. And it was still a sinful society. But in many ways, not all, but in many ways it was a better behaved society. Yep. And so there, yeah. it's challenging when you talk about these issues to make the distinction between the absolute nature of righteousness, the absolute nature of virtue, and, and the sort of practical realities of life on earth. When, when you say to a person that they can overcome, that they can kick cigarettes, that is absolutely true. And sometimes telling them that is actually encouraging and helps them helps them kind of realize that they're not just victims of circumstance. Uh, sometimes I think it can also be demoralizing to people because it because it um, almost obscures the other reality, which is that sin is very powerful; oh, that sin can't be done no, away with. I think that that's why the, 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 ge- the genius of, of uh, beating addiction. I, I was off cigarettes for five years. Was in. Uh, Amsterdam, where everybody was smoking on a book tour, and I thought, well, one cigarette. I was addicted like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, had to, I had to do it all over again. But but that's the thing, you know. It's not every day is a day. So like, if you get off it the next day, you're off it again, you know. And that's and that's what you have to do. You have sin to- is sin is always present. The flesh is always present. Yep. These things are incredibly powerful. It's very challenging. The the problem when I was a kid. Uh, and cartoons actually taught you things. Yeah. Uh, other, uh, they still teach you things. <laughs> but what do you mean, the, good things? Yeah. The common meme in <coughs> cartoons was that a person would have a decision to make, and a little angel would appear on one shoulder, yeah. and a little devil would appear on the other shol- sol- shoulder, and this one would try to make them be bad, and this one would try to make them be good. The, the problem as you become adult is that you realize there, there <coughs> is an angel on one shoulder, and there is a devil on the other, and they're both you, and they sound exactly the same. Mm. And that is one of the hardest things yeah. about life. And they both have your voice. They both have your voice. <laughs> yeah, the devil speaks to you in your own voice. That was Solzhenitsyn. That was Solzhenitsyn's great line that the line between good and evil runs through the human heart. You know, and it's it's not it's not actually about political systems. It's not actually about where you live or who you are. It's right there. You know, and, and that's the battle you're in. And you know, the thing about it is, I think Christians particularly have been very bad uh, about depicting this as some kind of uh, grim struggle, but it's actually a joyful struggle. It is. It's actually a it struggle to, to get to your joy. And what you were saying before about the lies of, of the flesh and the truth of the spirit is actually just siding with joy. It is, yeah. you know, it is. And it's, it's a funny thing because in the end, you know, joy takes a little bit longer to get to. You know, it's like the the, ple- the pleasure, the bliss of sin is there. I mean, it's like, there's, there's, no there's no question about this. I mean, people yelled at me in another kingdom for writing a scene about how great sex was when you uh, lied to a woman that she was going to get a part in your movie and then slept with her. It was great. And they yelled, oh, that's, that's pornographic. I said, no, no, that's the problem. Yeah. The problem is, it, it is great. You know, yeah. it's, it's just that the joy, which is a deeper emotion, a much more uh, global emotion, something that actually fills your whole life, takes longer to get to. But there's also, th- this is why Jordan Peterson is so popular. Oh, he's Jordan now? Jo- he's jo- you know, Jordan, Jordan. You know, Jordan. Jordan. This is yeah. why, it's, one, it's because of the accent, and two, it's because he <laughs> talks about dragons. And it's the same reason that the Latin mass is exploding in the United States, especially among young men. The, it's exactly the same reason, because this lame, super lib thing that we've heard for 50 years, like, hey, man, you know, your spirituality, it's all just about peace, man, you know, and all it is is just kind of acoustic guitars. No, it's about, like, there are actual dragons trying to eat me all around me (laughs) right now, and I just want to just slay that dragon in pursuit of something greater because the, the consequence of the spiritual combat that we're all in is not just that we're suffering a lot, it's that there's a prize, you know, there's something actually worth 
getting out yeah. of it. That's much, that, that's, that's much more motivating than just, you know, I, eh. I will say that the best thing about Jordan Peterson is listening to Knowles and my son Spencer do imitations of him. <laughs> of we would never do anything like that, Drew, and you better be sorry that you ever suggested we would. <laughs> it is one of the funniest bloody, things I've ever seen. <laughs> bloody ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, you start with Kermit the Frog. <laughs> you, take him, you take him to Toronto. <laughs> yeah, I, having Jordan on Daily Wire Plus has been a real treat for me because you guys kind of knew him better than I did, but I've gotten to interact with him a lot here. Uh, here lately, and I'm so tickled by what a contrarian he is. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. I just hadn't really realized it. I know it of myself, and I certainly know it of Andrew Clayton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but Jordan is like one of the only guys in, in public life. We're all contrarians, but we, we try to at least pretend to be you know, good and decent and <laughs> agreeable chaps. But with Jordan, you'll say something like, uh, here's a question from a Daily Wire uh, subscriber. Uh, uh, Dr. Peterson, you know, well, how can I be more happy? Well, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> and it's a damn foolish question. <laughs> what? That's pretty good, too. I got to say, we should just have a Jordan. Everybody does a Jordan Peterson. It's like Bill Clinton. You know, everyone has a Bill Clinton. By the way, that, that answer, actually, that you just gave in, in Jordan's name is the right answer. Of course. <laughs> but, but it, you know, the, the Bible, like the, the Old Testament, it does not really ever deal with the idea of happiness. It, ne it never discusses happiness. Yeah. It, it gives you a bunch of duties. It tells you a bunch of things to do. And then it promises you that there will be some good effects from the things that you do. But at no point does it say you will experience more joy in your life if you do X, Y, and Z, just on a, on a pure emotional level. Because no one can guarantee that up to and including God, I think. I mean, like that, that, one, that, that one really is up to you. That what, what, what isn't up to you is that if you, if you fulfill the duties, then you will be doing what you were established to do. That's I, the problem. I do I, believe I, that the I, New I Testament take, just, offers up joy as. I want to take an issue between the, right. Using, the, the Old Testament word, is not, but yeah. using the word joy and happiness as synonyms is not is not That's the right thing. I agree. I, I do not believe in happiness at all. Happy, you know, you're happy. You win the lottery. You're happy for a couple of minutes, and you know, you lose the lottery. You're not happy. But it, but joy is a, is a state of mind that actually is there even when you're in grief. You know, it is that yeah. vitality of life, the presence. You know, it's, I, I always compare it to a movie where you're watching some some character die and you're weeping, and then you come out and say, "Wow, it was a great movie." You know. Life is kind of like that too, you know. The, the vitality of, of all the things that happen in life is what joy is, and I think you can uh, achieve that if if you side with the spirit. I think it was C.S. Lewis who described it this way, and if not, I'll just make it up. Yeah, may go ahead. Him, that joy is more akin to uh, all just about just about being able to answer a question. Hmm. Like there's just mm -hmm. this kind of journey and this approach, and this you're so close to the satisfaction, which is very different than just you know. Hey, that was a good drink. Yeah, I'm happy, I'm now. happy now. Yeah. yeah. yeah in in uh, there's this very cryptic sort of commentary in uh, the book of Exodus, which I'm supposed to discuss with, with Jordan, actually, <laughs> in the interview with Jordan. Um, in in it, it discusses how the, the Jewish people come to the to Mount Sinai to Har Sinai, uh, and they're at the base of the mountain, and it says that they're uh, and and it says that they're tachat hahar. So the the actual Hebrew meaning of that is underneath the mountain. Tachat means under. It doesn't mean at the base. It means under the mountain. And so there are a bunch of commentaries, and these commentaries, the midrash, it suggests that that what God actually did is He holds the mountain over the heads of the Jews, and He says, if you don't accept the Torah, I'm going to drop this on you. <laughs> and so this raises all sorts of questions, Talmudically, like. Okay, so was the Torah accepted by the Jews under duress, right? I mean, was this, if, if and it's a full-scale conversation that goes on for a, a fair bit of time. And the, the sort of conclusion is, the, the only way to rectify that, that sort of bizarre take on the, on the narrative, that, that God is literally threatening you with destruction if you don't take, is that that's not God threatening you. That's just the reality. Yeah. That yeah. unless you undertake the duty of living as you were supposed to live, the mountain will fall on you. Yeah. That, that, that is not because God is threatening you that way. That's just the way the world yeah, is. Mean, right. Meanwhile, we've got I agree with that the, the culture which cuts off all the pathways to joy, which is, which is what's so sinister. I mean, <laughs> my favorite uh, New York Times piece recently, since we're talking about it, I think this is New York <laughs> Times, was uh, the, the maternal instinct. Yes, that was the New York Times. New York Times, okay, good. I'll do that at Washington Post. Maternal instinct is a, is a myth that men created. Yeah. 50 years ago, we made it up. <laughs> uh, but meanwhile, that's what, what she's really like militating against is, is women fulfilling their duties as mothers and finding joy and happiness yeah. in it. And, uh, and it's the same sort of thing where she, I, I read the whole piece and it's very, it's very windy and secure, secure this. And she, she kind of, she seems close to acknowledging that, oh, maternal instinct does exist. And by the end, she's like, no, it doesn't actually exist. <laughs> but that's, that's, you know, a path to joy, another one that they're trying to that's sort of cut off. No, almost as good as Scientific American, which sent out seven tweets. Did you guys see this? No, oh, no. oh, oh that the, the, the idea of two sexes was invented in the late 
uh, 18th century to uh, <laughs> to bring more, uh, you know, bigotry into human Right, they were life. less sexist in 1400. <laughs> <they were 1700. laughs> I, right. I don't know if you knew no, that. But before that, there was only one there sex, was scientifically. Man. Right, man. man. Yeah. And I, men men could have sex with men and make we, babies. It's amazing. <laughs> we actually invented women. <laughs> I, I, you know, I wish I could take credit for that. But like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. guess we did out of our rib, you know. They just got their time scale slightly <laughs> off. It it was I did see that, and I don't see nearly as much as you guys do. But I, I couldn't even really figure out oh, you have to, how they could possibly have it's, arrived. It's at the this opening conclusion. of my show tomorrow, it's, and I have to say, I've been la- I, whether I can get through this with a straight face, <laughs> I don't know because it, it is a, an amazing. I do. I, it actually makes me wonder if we're getting the gender conversation a little bit off, the, because the, our argument now, which is you know manifestly true, just looking around, is. There's sex and there's gender, and the, the libs say that gender expression and sex are divorced, and we say there's no such thing as gender, it's just sex, right? You met men and women, that's what it is. But in a sense, no, there is gender expression. Yes, of I mean, the, the, yeah. there is, first of all, and second of all, the very fact that they are expressing gender in these weird ways kind of proves that there is. And really, what we're trying to say is there is sex and gender expression, and the libs want them to be completely divorced. And if you want to have a good life and flourish and like be in accord with reality, you've got to just bring them together. <laughs> that actually, when men do manly things, they'll do better. And when women do womanly things, they'll but do better. But that's not really, that's not gender. That's what Jordan Peterson talks about. That's right. personality, right? That's what we're really talking but about. But I also disagree sex. because if... Uh... If reality has taught me anything here lately, it's that when men do womenly thi- feminine things, they do better. <laughs> they do, that's that's these days. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't understand. They keep telling us that gender and sex are different. Yeah. But then they also say things like trans women are biological women, <laughs> which is which is a. That's because they're loons. That's. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, well, oh, that solves it. It was okay. a sleight of hand trick where they invented this distinction between right that's sex and gender, and then it was very useful for them for about about three or four decades. And then in the last five years, they, they got rid of it, and they said, oh, it's actually the same thing again. So they, they got us to buy into They reverse engineered it. It was pretty, right. it was pretty yeah. clever. Yeah. But, you know, we even have words for this. When we say, like, the word womanish, yeah. we, we don't use it that much. Norm MacDonald used to use it a lot. Uh-huh. But womanish effeminate, is... Effeminate, yeah. Effeminate yeah. for a man. Yeah. You, you wouldn't call a woman womanish, right? A right. woman is womanly, and that's good. And when a man is behaving like a woman, that's womanish, and that's bad. Why are we saying that's like when good Like when your voice starts to wobble a little bit when you're talking to that guy from podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you don't, and you say, get it together. Come on, boring. Come on, boring. <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> Just punched myself in the crotch, you know, to try to... <laughs> No, I believe, I, I do believe. I mean, I, I, I've mentioned many times that Brian Stelter missed a deadline in order to go to bed and cry. And I, I think that, that, may prove, that may prove that you can change from a man to a woman. I... <laughs> okay, so, sorry, go ahead. No, well, I was going to say, we have a few questions from our Daily Wire Plus uh, members, but I'm going to save them for the member block, which is coming up here in 10 minutes. If you're, if you're watching on YouTube, head over to Daily Wire Plus. Uh, if you're a member, log in. If you're not a member, become a member, then log in. We're going to continue the show uh, for an additional half hour, and we're going to we'll take a ton of member questions during that period of time. Uh, but for uh, let's wrap up the show, Ben, with your okay. Thoughts. So I want to I want a quick roundtable here on um, what do you guys think is going to happen in the election, considering the polls have narrowed considerably and people are getting uh, very yeah. very nervous. I think it's all fake. I think the headlines are fake, and here's why: we had a ten point lead on the generic ballot in July. And which is amazing. I mean, that t- that's when you talk about the red tsunami. Now that lead has narrowed. It's a five point lead on the generic ballot. And they're saying, see, the walls are closing in. The Republicans are going to lose it for all sorts of reasons, whatever. Uh, but if you look back to 2018, the Democrats at this point had exactly the same lead as the Republicans did. And by the way, it narrowed as the election got closer. That's just what kind of happens. And they went on to win. And they crushed it. Yeah, they absolutely crushed it. So I think that the libs are just trying to discourage conservatives. I think the numbers don't bear out this fear that we're all of a sudden going to lose our I, I, you know, I largely agree with that. I, th- I thought you, on your tweet, thread about this. You made a really good point that uh, focusing on Trump uh, may hurt us with independence. The people who attacked you immediately said, well, Trump is, you know, the, Trump's selections have won all these primaries. And you think, yeah, but that's not the point. You're talking about the generals, the, general, right? the generals. <laughs> right. But, but I basically agree with what you're saying. Typically, summer polls are worse uh, than autumn polls because they don't poll likely voters as much. They tend to f- uh, favor Democrats. The polls have narrowed. I, I do believe... The specials are not going as well. What's that? The special but the specials, well. But the specials, 8% of people are showing up for those specials. And I, I don't think, yeah. I think... I think that the, the abortion question may serve the left more than we, we thought. 
But I think that if Republicans can get their heads around the fact that they have to fight the culture war, that they have to fight the culture war, they can bring people out. One place where I disagree with you is you frequently say that people vote against things. But I think only conservatives vote against things. I think women and other Democrats uh, <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah. basically do vote for things because they want the government to do stuff. Yeah, well, and, and I think, but I do think you're you're right in terms of the numbers. Right now, the numbers still favor. Uh, Republicans, and I think as the autumn continues, they're going to favor Republicans more. And I actually think we have still have a an over fifty percent chance of taking the Senate. Yeah, mm. yeah, okay. might be like fifty two, but it's yeah, yeah, it is. It's like fifty five. I, I I agree that the polls are fake and everything's fake, and that's that's probably correct. <laughs> but I, I'm not as, as nervous about the polls. I'm I agree with Ben's take on this largely. I mean, I'm just nervous about what I see from Republicans, which is it does seem like they're they're getting off message. Uh, when the FBI raid happened and there are all these predictions on the right that, well, this is what's going to lead to the red wave. It's like, like people are not going to the polls to protect Donald Trump. That's not what they're, they're not getting up, you know, parents are not waking up in the morning thinking, well, how's Donald Trump doing today yeah. with the FBI thing? What, what Republicans need to think about is what do people wake up in the morning worried about? What do they go to bed worried about? The whole cliche classic thing, what are they talking about around the kitchen table? Like that is actually true. And what are they thinking about? They're thinking about their finances. They're thinking about inflation. They're thinking about, uh, are my kids safe, crime? They're, they're, they're really, really worried about the fact that it, it seems to them that our culture is plunging into insanity. They're worried about what kind of culture we're leaving for our kids. These are the things that plague people's minds every single day. When, when it seemed to me when Republicans were talking about that, that, that uh, they were doing well. And then when we went, we went on this detour and we're talking about Trump and the FBI, then that's when the but polls the started to But the FBI raid, the, the issue with them raiding Mar-a-Lago is not... Donald Trump. The issue with them raiding Mar-a-Lago is that Biden himself is saying it's about us. <laughs> He's going to yeah. sick the IRS on us. I think, at least for me, when I the reason I care about the Mar-a-Lago raid is not because uh, you know I'm upset about Donald Trump's furniture getting moved around. It's that I think Trump is. It's like that meme he put out in the campaign. They're going th- through him but to he, get to us because the they problem. call us all fascists. I don't. And, yeah. I don't disagree that you're right. And eventually, Biden. I mean, he keeps saying he's going to send F-15s to blow us up. Yeah. This isn't the first time he said it. Uh, they are they, they are fighting a proxy war against us by way of Trump. That still doesn't make it a winning thing for us to talk about right now. The average American is not sitting around today worried that the FBI is going to raid their houses and look for classified documents. <laughs> the average American today is is not relitigating 2020. That's right. Yeah. The yeah, average right. American that's today so is right. trying to figure out how to pay for gas when it's so freaking expensive. And when Joe Biden is saying, oh, I brought gas prices down 43 cents, you know, it's up two bucks, the asshole. <laughs> like, we, uh, the average American is deeply concerned right now about what has happened to their kids over the last two yeah. years. The fact that suicidality is up so high, that drug use is up so high. The average American is worried about what their kids are being taught, about what kind of lives their kids should lead. Uh, these are the kinds of issues that if, we're, if we run on them, we win. And the problem with President Trump is that he wants this election to be a referendum on him because Donald Trump sees the entire world as a referendum on him. He puts his name in gold letters on everything that he touches. He is, he is constitutionally, and I don't mean the document, he is constitutionally incapable of allowing the election to be about the things that matter to America because he wants to be the thing that matters most to Americans. And that may very well be fine in a presidential election. It is not, I, I, even then, I actually agree with Ben. I think that all modern elections are referendums on someone. And you should make sure it's a referendum on the other guy. But even if it could work in 2024 with Donald Trump, it is a losing strategy for Republicans. That's also right what now. the Democrats. That's what the Democrats want too. I, I right. think this is very simple. Think about what they think want about what the opposites. Right. Think about what your opponents <laughs> want to talk about, and then don't talk about that thing. <laughs> think about the things they really don't want you to talk about, and talk about that thing. The trans stuff. They will call you a terrorist if you talk about it. They <laughs> hey. desperately. They will kick you off of every social media platform if you talk about it. Obviously, that's the thing we should be talking about. The economy, they don't want to talk about. Like, those are the things. They really, really want us to talk about Trump. But that, that is enough reason in and of itself and, and, and you know, to not talk about and, it. And you know, the thing about Trump is I keep getting these letters every time I criticize him, you know, like, oh, you're criticizing the great Trump. You know, I, I, I have to say this. Trump, to me, is, is not what I'm here for. Like, I am here for this country. I, am, I'm, I got into this business because of this country because I actually do love it. And I think, like, if Trump can help, I'm for Trump. If, if he's past his point, and I think he is past the point where he can help, I'm for somebody else. You know, it's like it's not really about Trump. And I think that, that, that this attachment to him, and as you say, Trump is a narcissist. Nobody would, de- I don't think even Trump would deny that. I think Trump is a narcissist. He may not know what a narcissist is, but yeah. if you give him the question of 
Donald Trump, are you a narcissist? I'm the biggest narcissist. Yeah, I can't yeah, I'm, Trump I'm, the, I'm the best, best narcissist. narcissist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I just think that we should be thinking about how to win for the country. Uh, yeah. Trump's not on the ballot. He's not going to be on the ballot. The people who are on the ballot, we should support them because basically the alternative is are these guys who if Donald, put your children. If Donald Trump's the nominee in 2024, I will almost certainly vote for him. Yep. Right. Uh, I'll never say certainly two years out from an right. election. You're just not going to get that out of me. But yeah. most likely, if Donald Trump is the nominee, I will almost certainly vote for the guy. Like you, uh, he did an awful lot of good in the first three years of, administra- of his administration. I think it's very hard to say that he wasn't, his presidency in the fourth year was a failure. I mean, he, he lost the country during COVID. Does that mean that he would be a failure in a second term? No. I mean, yeah. if the guy gets a second term, undoubtedly, a lot of great things will happen that I really like from a policy point of view. That's great. This is 2022. Right. Alan Estrin, right. our dear friend and the founder of Prager University, has a theory. And his theory is that narrative is sort of a, uh, an actual force that exists in the world. I'm actually somewhat persuaded by this argument, I, I'm by the way. I'm 100% with this argument. Yeah. That narr- in the same way that Bible, uh, Ben often says of the Bible that it's not always prescriptive, it's almost always descriptive. I think Alan Estrin's new theory is that uh, narrative isn't our way of talking about, narrative isn't a human construct for understanding the world. Uh, narrative is something that humans have observed about the world. And I, I'm, I'm compelled by this to some degree. He says in the great narrative of our time, yes, it is all about Donald Trump. That it isn't even about whether or not Donald Trump makes it about himself, which of course he will. It's that they have it's made it about, about Donald Trump. And then in this sort of grand narrative uh, sense, the, the fight of the century has to happen. America will not be able yes. to let go of this crazy moment in our politics mm-hmm. Until we see what happens with Donald Trump in 2024. When people tell me, when people tell me, well, if only Trump would go away, if only Trump would be keep quiet, if only we were, we can move past Donald Trump. I think, you know, if my aunt had testicles, she'd be my uncle, right? You know, there's a lot of ifs here. She might still be your aunt. And she might, and these days she might still be my aunt. It's, it, that's not, that's not the way it's working. The libs are targeting all of their fire on this guy. To me, that speaks well of him. Uh, But regardless, they're going to do that. They're going to put this in the news. The guy is polling 40 points ahead of anybody else for 2024. He's playing an active role in the midterms, as would anyone who's going to run for president in 2024. And and so it's just, that is just a fact. It's baked into it right now. And I I, I just don't think there's, I don't think there's all that much use in saying, well, what if this fundamental fact of the political landscape were different? Okay, but here's the way it is. No, 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 no. I have made a executive God King like decision. (laughs) To let Michael Knowles have the last word for oh the God. first time in the, history, <laughs> in the history of the Daily Wire backstage. Uh, and I'm going to say that if you want to hear what we all think about how wrong Michael Knowles is, <laughs> you have to head over to dailywireplus.com and become a subscriber. You don't want to miss the rest of the show. We're going into the member block right now. If you use code PLUS, you will get 35% off and you can stick around for the next half hour. We're going to be taking member questions and talking probably more about Donald Trump. Because even when the message is, it would be better electorally to stop talking about Donald Trump. You can't resist. And it ain't better for ratings. (laughs) We'll see you guys next time. (laughs) All right. And now it's the member block. Thank you to all of our Daily Wire members for, uh, I guess, still being here.